Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Thank you, Teresa. We are in show number 32. Great. It's been so much fun. The last week we had a great time talking about two priests that have come over, had a difficult experiences uh, due to the French, French Revolution, Revolution and, yeah. and the impact they made here locally. Fantastic story that we reap the benefit of the French Revolution. Yeah, sad as it is. Yes, we, yes. The, But, yeah, you're right. America really did benefit uh, the Catholic Church in America in a very huge way. We ended up with a lot of very wonderful religious, with laity, with bishops, intellectuals, the Sulpicians coming over in large numbers, and it really benefited from that. You know, it, it, it kind of harkens back. We've talked about many times throughout our series of the blood of the martyrs. And yeah. Even though the blood was spilled more over across the ocean, we we were certainly beneficiaries, and you know the beneficiaries, and you know the world, the greater church was. Yeah. The beneficiaries of uh, the lives of these incredible men. So, and women, and we're going to talk about a woman today. Great. Last time around, we talked about Father Dunard. He hailed from the meadows and forests of eastern France near Alsace. Yes. We also talked about Father Nerinx, and he came from the lowlands of Belgium. And now we're going to talk about Rose Philippine Duchenne, who was a mountain girl. <laughs> she came from Grenoble, which is the capital in the diocesan sea in the French Alps. Okay. It is has majestic landscape, deep river ravines, incredible pine forests. I, I was very privileged to be able to go through Grenoble on my way to La Salette when I made a pilgrimage to La Salette, which is nestled up in those mountains above Grenoble itself. I remember you telling of the harrowing drive oh, up to yeah, La Salette. It's, it's, it's very dangerous, yeah. Uh, switchbacks and huge ravines. And the year before we went, there was a busload of Polish pilgrims that didn't make it. They went over the side, and I think 35 of them died. So it, it is. Yeah, it's a very rugged, very pristine. Even the capital itself, Grenoble today, is a, a provincial capital. Both sides of Rose Philippines' family came from that region. Both of them are prominent. The Duchenne family, a lot of lawyers. Her mother's side of the family are the Perriers. I'm not sure where they got their money. They came from water, well-connected. Their homes were huge. They had multiple mansions. You know, she was definitely born into a lap of luxury. And this region is called Dauphiny. And her father is Pierre-Francois Duchesne. She is the second daughter of Pierre-Francois and her mother, Marie-Louise Enfantine Perrier. The first girl in the family died when she was uh, yet quite young, you know, as a child. And so Rose Philippine is born on August 29th, 1769. She was baptized shortly after and given the name Rose in order to honor the first saint of the Americas. Oh, my goodness. And uh, Philip, the apostle. That's how we end up with Rose Philippine. Ultimately, there are 12 more children that are going to come uh, from that family, although only six of them will actually survive to adulthood. Wow. So it tells us something about infant mortality at that time. We're talking about people of means. Mm -hmm. You know, they're they're wealthy enough to take care of their children, keep them warm in the winter time, keep them well clothed, doctors, the whole works. And yet, even then, half of the children will die. At six years old, Rose Philippine would not have been aware of this, but her family and especially her father would have been. There was a new tax that had come out of of Versailles. And the people were very upset with this, and they protested. This is way before the French Revolution. The people in Grenoble protested this new tax, and the end result is that the local parlement, which is this administrative court, was closed down for three and a half years. Uh, that puts the lawyers out of business, mm -hmm. and lawyers tend to be bright and articulate, and so they didn't exactly let this slide during that time. Also, there's a personal tragedy that takes place in 1778 in which her sister, who is at that time barely 11 years old, 
This is Marie Adelaide dies also. This is her older sister. Okay. Now Rose Philippine is the oldest in the family. While these things are happening, a political event of which Rose Philippine would not have been aware of, a personal tragedy which took away her friend, playmate, older sister. There's also another quiet tragedy taking place in the family that would have been under the surface for her too. And that was that her father, Pierre Francois, was becoming more and more attracted to the works and the words of the Enlightenment philosophs. Mm -hmm. As a result, also less and less faithful to his Catholic faith. He looked upon religion, as most of these philosophs did, as basically just sentiment, and it's something for women and girls and children to be involved with, and especially nuns, which is a real shame because two of his sisters were visitation nuns, and uh, they were cloistered in Romain, which is not too far away. Ultimately, there comes a point in time in 1781 when Rose Philippine is old enough to go to school, and she and her younger sister, Josephine, are then sent off to a boarding school in Grenoble. It's a visitation convent. And the name of it is Saint-Marie Dono. Dono is D apostrophe E-N, then H-A-U-T. Okay. So it literally is the convent of St. Mary way up there, <laughs> <laughs> up on the heights. Okay, and it is. It's, it's way up high. Um, and so Rose Philippine goes to school there. She loves it, absolutely falls in love with the nuns, the, with the school itself, especially there's a, a one particular a nun that, that she is very attracted to. It's uh, Sister Eugenie, and this sister helps her to develop a devotion to the Sacred Heart, which the visitation nuns were very much involved in anyway because, remember, the St. Margaret Mary Alaco, yeah. one of their own, had had the visions of the Sacred Heart, and so that was the grounding, the foundation of that great devotion. Rose Philippine was attracted not only to the devotion to the Sacred Heart, but also to religious life. That's not just because of her experience at Saint Marie, but also because of her two aunts, the two visitation nuns, who she was able to, to visit from time to time, and even as early as 12 years old, and so she got a chance to know them, admired them. She also had a chance to meet some of the ex-Jesuit priests. Remember, they had been expelled from America, yes. and some of them had come over. Uh, there was one in particular, a Father Jean-Baptiste Aubert, that lived in the city. And he would love to tell stories of his adventures when he was a Jesuit in Louisiana. And he would talk about places like Kaskaskia and Cahokia, all of this, of course, before the suppression of the order. So at one point, the topic of a religious vocation comes up in the Duchenne household. Her mother thought that she was too young and should put this off for a while. She was actually only 14 years old at this point. Her father had other objections, and he decided to take her out of school and bring her back home and then have her homeschooled. And so that's exactly what happened. She then was put under the tutelage of a, this is a religious title that is less than a priest. When we hear the word abbe, we think abbot, but uh, it, it's not. This is a, 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 someone who has received very minor orders, okay? okay? And his name is Abbe Raylan. He's hired to teach the Duchenne children, and he does that, music, drawing, the other uh, normal subjects. And it seems as though Rose Philippine accepted this change of fortune very well. But one of the things we're going to find about her throughout her life is though she, although she is docile to obedience, she also has a huge amount of self... Hutzpah. Hutzpah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's a good one. And so while she's at home, she also kept the disciplines that she had learned at St. Marie. And that meant getting up early in the morning, doing morning meditation, attending Mass as frequently as she could get away with, taking communion often, and keeping her devotion to the Sacred Heart. This is lifelong habit for this woman, accepting reversals and disappointments and then finding a way around them in order to use her unbendable resolve, which she knows she needs to do. 
In the meantime, her father was becoming more and more radicalized. He found himself reading and quoting Voltaire, attending discussion groups that advocated radical solutions to the social problems of the day. Uh, there's some evidence that he even played with the ideas of Freemasonry. I, I don't think he joined, but you know, he played around with it. And then there are events that take place in 1788. There is something of a riot that happens in Grenoble. It's known as the Day of the Tiles, T-I-L-E-S. Mm -hmm. What happened was the when the Paris Parliament closed down the provincial court in Grenoble, the people rose up and they even went to the governor's residence and they demanded that he reopen the Parliament. They came to his residence with axes. Soldiers had to come and rescue the governor. And the people then, in order to protest the soldiers, went up to the roofs throughout the city and they broke away the slate tiles and began throwing them down at the soldiers. Ultimately, the French are going to have to send in 20,000 troops in order to enforce martial law. Wow. Yeah. 20,000 20, troops. Now, this is a year before the beginning of the French Revolution. So you can see there's a lot of foment. It's, it's been developing. <laughs> yeah, it's been developing. And what happens is that now the city is under martial law. A lot of uh, the prominent citizens go away from the city. They go out to the Perrier residence, which is this big, beautiful mansion, and they gather there again in order to state their grievances. So now you have two minds within the Duchenne household. You've got the <laughs> father who is his revolution burning in his heart. He is encouraged by the Enlightenment writers. He is armed with legal expertise. Mm -hmm. You know, he's moving in one direction. At the very same time, he's got a teenage daughter yes. who wants to serve Christ as a Catholic nun. So you can imagine it's a little tense in the household at the time. People have moved out to the Perrier residence, which is what They're Mrs. Just Duchenne, family. it's her family. It's her family. And, yeah. and they're, now, they're sympathetic with the church? No. No, they're no, not. Oh, okay. No, no. Um, th these are these are leaders within the radical movement okay. within Grenoble. They've been closed down in Grenoble okay, okay. because of the troops that are there. Mm -hmm. They go out to the Perrier residence in order to write up their grievances. Okay. Well, okay, this is 1788. Mm -hmm. Okay. Rose Philippine turns 18. Her father is not around a lot because he's attending revolutionary meetings and writing up revolutionary things and all that kind of stuff. And so at the age of 18, Rose Philippine turns to one of her aunts and says, Aunt Perrier, would you like to go with me to Saint-Marie-Donon and make a little visit? She says, oh, that would be very nice. Let's go. So they get up, and when they do, they visit the visitation superior. This is Mother de Mirinay, and they're sitting there in her office, and at this point, Rose Philippine declares that she understands it's God's will for her to enter the convent. Well, Aunt Perrier is <laughs> taken by surprise. So is the superior. Aunt Perrier said, you can't do that. You've got to come back down. The superior said, she's in her majority. If she wants to join, we'll take her you know, as a postulant, and we can see how things work out. Well, so in the end, Aunt Perrier goes down the hill by herself and goes to the Duchenne family to tell them what had just happened. A couple days later, mother, father, and baby Melanie went up to the convent, tried to persuade Rose Philippine to come back down. She wouldn't go. She wouldn't leave, uh huh? And so there is a, a very unfortunate and painful split that takes place, but it's inevitable. Mm hmm now, we'll see a little later on that there's a reconciliation, but at that particular moment, it's not good. Mm -hmm. okay. But there she is now in the convent, and on September 10th of 1788, there is an assembly of grievances in Romain, in Dauphiny. Okay, the town itself, it's the same as Romans, R-O-M-A-N-S. Almost everybody who is a firebrand is there. And they're all signing. The one firebrand, the leader of this group that's not there, happens to be Pierre-Francois Duchesne. He is not in that revolutionary group. Where is he? 
He's at the convent of Saint-Marie d'Aunay, witnessing his daughter receiving the habit of a visitation nun as a novice. So the fervor of the revolution is not enough to overcome the love of father and daughter. Later on, he's going to also intercede uh, with her to keep her alive. In September of 1789, Rose Philippine is accepted into the visitation order. She takes vows. These are simple vows. Mm -hmm. And she then begins moving into the serene life of the novitiate, deepening in meditation, practicing living in the presence of God, consciously devotion to the Sacred Heart, and also she develops a particular devotion for and admiration of St. John Francis Regis, the Jesuit who had been a foreign missionary himself and particularly dedicated to the poor. The uh, convent had a relic of St. John Francis uh, Regis, and Rose Philippine would often pray before it, asking for the grace to follow in his footsteps. It's that devotion that she's going to have that will be with her the whole of her life. When she comes to America, one of the th most prized possessions she's going to have is a, an oil painting of St. Francis Regis. Events are taking place rapidly outside of this wonderful little convent. There are protests. There are riots. There's an unsolvable debt crisis added to that at particular year, 1788-79. There were crop failures that took place. There were supply chain glitches, a very harsh winter. And so things really now teeter out of control. Louis the Sixteenth, the, the king, asks everyone in France to write to him for suggestions and to make whatever complaints. The idea is open transparency. And these letters, they're called the cahier, came in a lot more than what he had expected. <laughs> I mean, there were floods that came into Versailles. And so in desperation, he called then a constitutional assembly, called the Estates General. Long story short, the Estates General was an absolute disaster. Mm -hmm. Within a couple weeks, the three estates, the first estate, which is made up of clergy, which are all bishops, the second estate made up of nobles, and the third estate made up of uh, the common people, cannot get along. And in the end, the third estate, which is made up of everybody but it's mainly being represented by lawyers. Ah, there you go again, lawyers, mm -hmm. uh, academics, philosophers, the big merchants. I mean, we're talking, you know, the, the big stuff, uh, shippers, bankers, that they're representing the 97% of the population, the French population. And they then turn around and simply demand that they become the National Assembly. And with that, the whole order of uh, the social order of France crumbles and now you have a, a, a revolution that's taking place. It's at this point that Pierre-Francois Duchesne realizes that things are getting very diffy. They're, they're dicey. They're not dangerous yet, but they're dicey. And so he refuses to allow Rose Philippine to make final vows in, in the convent. She's going to be crushed by that. Mm -hmm. But there's an old priest that tells her this, and I quote, Adore God, my child. He has his secret designs in which he allows to happen today. Later on, you'll understand. And later on, she will understand. I'm getting a lot of this material first from Father Rothensteiner, but also there's a wonderful biography by Sister Cullen of Rose Philippine de Chen. I'll bring it in next week and, okay. and give you the, the bibliographical information on it. It's been around a good number of years, but it's really the, the standard work for Rose Philippine. Well, her life up to now obviously we're short of final vows here but yeah what a, a tumultuous time and, yeah and it, their family uh, experiences through here the couple patterns we're seeing taking mm -hmm. place already with her and that is that all the challenges she's going to have and she's not finished with her challenges <laughs> they get some of them get very personal and very spiritual and yet she's going to find a way through her incredible faith find a way through each of these and then, as strong-willed as she is, mm -hmm. there are those moments when she just steps back in docility and says, just like that priest, I don't understand this, but it's the will of God, and I will understand it someday. Boy, that's the challenge right there, to accept 
and yeah. to be docile to that you can't see that there's a reason that there must be yeah i mean the fact is that had she taken those vows she would have been targeted been, by the revolutionary absolutely. government she probably would have been guillotined mm -hmm. somewhere along the lines especially since she was the kind of nun that would have stood up to <laughs> the revolutionaries yeah mm -hmm. so God saved her for a different purpose. Now, looking back, we know what that is. But at That's the right. time, it, at the time, it had to be very difficult for her to see that she accepted it in humility, thanks to the wonderful advice of that priest. Although right. It sounds like she had that experience throughout a lot of her life of having to accept what, what yeah. you didn't think was your plan. Right. <laughs> so. And so in 1790, the revolutionary government's going to, again, it's going to close down all convents and monasteries that don't have a, quote, practical purpose to them mm -hmm. because praying is not efficacious from the revolutionary point of view. It's, you know, there's a secular point of view. And so, but then they're very slow at getting around to enforcing it. It's going to be 1792 when Saint Marie is closed down. The troops will come in, send the nuns away, and she is then going to return back to her family. And she'll be living then for the next couple of years as a lay woman. But we're going to see next time around, she takes her Christianity very serious and, again, risks her life as a lay woman. Looking forward to that. Good. All right. So thank you very much for this beginning introduction to the life of St. Rose Philippine Duchenne. Yeah. This was show number 32. Great. Shall we close with a prayer and yeah. blessing? Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. May Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Rose Philippine Duchenne. Pray for us. Amen. Thank you so much, Monsignor. Sure. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.